Hello, my name is Major Matt Wunderlich, and I'm a pilot in the United States Air Force. So there I was, flying in the Sahel over southern Mali at 300 feet above ground. It was a hot and, and, and hazy day uh, over the heart of Africa. We came in at 300 feet, and my co-pilot was the first to find the, the landing panels, marking 3,000 feet of sandy runway. We came in fast and low, maintaining radio silence. We quickly touched down and opened the aircraft doors. Special Forces operators quickly exited the airplane, and moments later we began our takeoff roll. As we lifted off of the runway, I looked out of my aircraft window and saw as personnel began to rise from concealed locations around the runway. What I witnessed was a thousand person maneuver of joint interagency, multinational personnel in perfect concert. I was, there was no doubt in my mind as to how I stood. It was a perfectly orchestrated mission. Two months later, I received a phone call from higher headquarters telling me to prepare for a crisis that was developing in the African nation of Chad. The Department of State would soon be uh, calling to provide guidance. In the meantime, I was told to get, get, get ready. The, the, with a little bit of research, we came to understand that after a decade-long civil war, the country had, had tipped into a humanitarian crisis. The United Nations was clamoring for international response as the United States was considering total citizen evacuation and closing the embassy. And still no, no call came down from the Department of State. The unknowns quickly, quickly mounted. We didn't know if we were bringing supplies in, bringing personnel out, if, uh, if the security situation was, was stable, how many airplanes, uh, many unknowns quickly manifested. And still no call came down from the Department of State. Despite this, we had to plan, and so we treated it just like any other mission, like a combat support mission, such as the one in Mali two months prior, or combat operations as well. We began to prepare airplanes and crews, and even though the Department of State never responded or gave any, any semblance of guidance, my squadron leadership decided to send the mission forward to a neighboring African nation. We went without a mission. What this should sound like would be something like, ready, fire, aim. Instead of adding to the humanitarian orchestra, I was just adding to the noise. So the question is, how can the United States translate its combat effectiveness into humanitarian capabilities? How can we bring our, our whole of government together with one voice to bring solutions to humanitarian crises? The solution rests in a synchronized joint interagency, intergovernmental, and multinational strategy, humanitarian strategy that focuses on timeliness, effects that are trained, interoperable, and responsive in order to bring good throughout the world. The situation in Chad demonstrated many lessons learned in humanitarian operations that unfortunately would be learned again in September of 2014. In 2014, we saw the world experience the worst Ebola outbreak. This horrible virus spread rapidly throughout West Africa, with isolated cases appearing in Europe as well as even in the United States. America responded with Operation United Assistance, and the United States Agency for Internal Development became the lead agent, along with other forms of government. The Department of Defense, the Department of State, the Department of Health and Human Services went to Africa to respond. And this is our current state. Taking these lessons learned enables us to understand how we stand as, as a, with our humanitarian capabilities. On the doctrinal front, when we arrived, it was as though the, the different actors were on different sets of music with different diverging interests and capabilities that didn't quite synchronize. This ultimately degraded the overall humanitarian effectiveness. On the organizational front, all the agencies didn't quite organize with, with a delineated and transparent purpose. What this created was significant redundancies and ultimately a mili military hierarchy that took over. Ultimately, again, degrading our, our operational effectiveness. The first time that we, we performed together in the training front was during the crisis. We didn't practice before we went, we went in. And this created significant training shortfalls that should have been encountered during training, such as communication, 
shortfalls that we, we couldn't speak to one another or use the common, common networks. We had complex issues, such as uh, military logistics that didn't, that didn't quite uh, synchronize, and, and so we weren't able to solve the crisis or help the crisis like we should have been able to. And finally, Operation United Assistance in the Ebola fight showed us the problem of, of not having an empowered leadership. There is no clear leader, and an orchestra without a conductor is, is doomed to fail. So understanding this current, uh, this current uh, capabilities and where we stand in our humanitarian operations enables us to, to think forward and, and where we want to go in our desired future state of humanitarian strategy. And what that would look like is a humanitarian strategy that, that articulates a humanitarian doctrine for all the agencies to get us all on the same sheet of music that we have a common approach to why we're operating and how we're operating. Additionally, our desired future state would be an organization that clearly articulates roles and responsibilities and relationships. Our future state would also employ trained personnel that that have practiced together before they perform. And finally, we, would, we desire a, a leadership that is clearly empowered, a conductor that can control the tempo of the orchestra, control the tempo of the operation to heighten the amount of, of capability and, and address the crisis in its entirety. Bridging from this current state to from where we are requires four efforts. The first effort is on the doctrinal front. We require a comprehensive and overarching humanitarian strategy guide for the whole of government to abide by during future humanitarian crises. Getting us on the same sheet of music is required in order to share a vernacular to operate in the future. The second effort mandates an organization, a transparent organization that focuses on relationships with roles and responsibilities articulated. And just as an orchestra, orchestra doesn't haphazardly spread instruments around a room, we should cluster effects so that brass are together to amplify their effects. The woodwinds, the military logistics, communication. This cluster-based approach to organization is critical to galvanize one, one another's capabilities to amplify the overall humanitarian effectiveness. Along with doctrine and organization, the third effort mandates training. And we need to practice before we perform. This is, will, will be accomplished by training events, by bringing humanitarian objectives into military exercises and operations. But not only through military, but interagency exercises and operations as well. We require enduring liaisons and to build relationships during times of peace that can be relied upon during times of crisis. The fourth effort is, is leadership. We require an empowered leader who can conduct and control the operation with the appropriate authority and responsibility to control the situation. By synchronizing America's foreign humanitarian strategy we can turn the noise into music by outlining an overarching and comprehensive doctrine with transparent organization, interoperable training, and empowered leadership. We can aim before we fire. By addressing the human dimension of humanitarian operations, we can leverage America's power for good. But we must ready ourselves now to prepare for the crises of tomorrow. We must aim high to comprehensively address humanitarian crises. And finally, we must fire with one voice in harmony to synchronize America's humanitarian strategy. Thank you.